that not making you nervous? It makes me nervous. Why don't we lift our voices and thank the Lord for what we feel in this place. Lord, we thank you for what we feel tonight. This beautiful, beautiful music, beautiful praise and exhortation that is going up to you tonight, God. We worship your mighty name. We praise you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Your name, O oh Lord, is to be praised. Oh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. That's what the Bible says. Praise God, praise God, praise God. What a joy to be here. Uh, when I tell you, we have thoroughly enjoyed it. My wife, she's going on now. She's in the air right now, as a matter of fact. She'll be arriving at midnight tonight, which that's three hours ahead, so next couple hours. And then I'll be flying back to Florida tomorrow preaching the weekend. And we'll meet up Sunday night once all the ministry work is done. But these few days that we've been here with you, we have thoroughly enjoyed both the services with you, worshiping the Lord, and also the fellowship with your wonderful pastor and his wife. Also with Brother and Sister Williams, we've been blessed to have a good group over here. Aren't you blessed in the leadership that God has given this church? Amen. Amen. This kind of stuff doesn't just happen accidentally. It takes work and labor. You have to be intentional. You have to know what you're trying to build and then how to put the building blocks in place. Uh, just a few things that I want to say as we get ready to go to the word of the Lord. Um, again, thank you for all the kindness and hospitality that you show my wife and I. But one thing that I've noticed with COVID and all that we've dealt with with that is the strong seem to have gotten stronger and the weak unfortunately seem to have gotten weaker so just decide which direction you want to be going with that <laughs> and pray that you're getting stronger because the church as a whole has been tested and tried and been a little bit of a trial all of us indirectly have as well but I have a prophetic word I need to speak to this church. The Lord spoke to me very strong. Actually, I think the first day I was here said they have been tried as a body, but there's a short season in front of you, a short season, where you will be tried and tested personally. If you're a person who's easily offended, you're going to have an opportunity. If you're easily discouraged, you're going to have a chance. If you're easily full of fear, it's, it's getting ready to happen. If the slightest thing distracts you, you're about to be distracted. So the purpose of the prophetic word is to alert you. And hopefully by being more alerted, more aware, you'll say, ah, that's what he said. Okay, I'm not going to. This is a prophecy intended to avert <laughs> the consequence, not guarantee it's going to happen and I think we can be wise of the devil's devices but you're going to be tested personally now don't let that upset you too bad uh, if you pass the test there's usually a promotion a graduation an elevation and so as the enemy comes to try to get you off course when you stand your ground and stay your course and maintain your faith I'm going to preach to you tonight and prophesy into this church tonight some of the great blessings of the Lord that I believe are just about to be poured out upon some folks. Amen. Amen. Feel it so very strong. You know, impartation, we talk a lot about words. Sometimes we're not sure what they are. Impartation is when somebody shares with you the timeless biblical truth. You know, the Bible never changes. The Bible's forever settled. The timeless truth that is to every generation but they share it with you through their personal experience with those verses so if we all talked about how we were born again Acts 2.38 the death, burial, and resurrection would be the same for all of us that's the timeless biblical truth but as you told your story and I told mine they'd be a little different that's impartation so I tell you that to tell you the vast majority of this message tonight is intended to be impartation these are some things that have happened to me that I want to release to happen to you. And there's Bible for that. The Apostle Peter said one time, such as I have. 
So I want to give and release some things into the atmosphere that have happened in our life and let them happen upon you. I'll be going to Mark chapter 5 verse 1. And I've spent a couple of nights and days here. We've been digging in a little deep, purifying our motives, consecrating ourselves. So I don't have three or four days to get us to the mountain. We're going to have to go in one <laughs> rocket shot. <laughs> because tonight, I'm not going to build up to it. I'm just going to throw the whole enchilada of God's goodness and blessing on you. Amen. I hope you're ready. Hallelujah. Why don't you just clap your hands under the Lord one more time? Would you do that? Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Mark chapter 5, verse 1, they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying, cutting himself with stones. I mean, this guy's not your average case. He's pretty far gone. Later on, we find out just how bad the demonic infestation in his life was. But look at this next phrase. But even though he's living in the tombs, he's howling at the moon, he's wild, tearing his clothes off, running around naked. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. That tells me you can worship the Lord no matter what condition you're in. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with Jesus? Now this now switches back to the demonic spirit, crying with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. He's trying to rebuke God in the name of God. <laughs> he said unto him, Come out of the man, and thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he said, My name is Legion, we are many. Verse 14, They come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil that had the legion sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Verse 18, when he came to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed with him that he might be with him. He wanted to join the evangelistic crusade. Howbeit, Jesus suffered him not. He said, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and have had compassion on thee. I want to preach for a few minutes tonight. Hell damaged, but heaven blessed. Lord, I pray you administer to every person in the sound of my voice. Give me strength to minister. Give my voice strength tonight. We'll give you praise and glory and honor. And everybody said with a loud voice in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. There's lots of things I like about these verses. I like the fact that it tells the full story of his situation. It doesn't candy coat it. He's a lunatic. He's a wild man. He's living in the tombs. He's tearing his clothes off. He's running around naked. He's demon-possessed with legions of devils. They try to chain him up and bind him, and that doesn't hold. This man is an extreme case. I'm hoping we don't have anybody here that bad off tonight. Best I can tell, there's a little glare from the lights, but everybody seems to be at least clothed. Fortunately, I'm terribly nearsighted, so I won't know if that happens to change. And even in his condition with demons and his mind totally warped, his wild condition he was in, when he saw Jesus afar off, he runs to him. That means he exercised his human will, and his human will was stronger than all of those legion of devils. I need to tell you, no matter what the devil's doing in your life, no matter how bad the situation, no matter how difficult it seems, how strong the chains of darkness and bondages may be in your life, you can worship God if you want to. There's not a devil that can stop you if you want to say, blessed be the mighty name of the Lord. Amen. It, that's up to us. That's our will. Whosoever will, let him come. 
And then, of course, Jesus heals the man, casts the devil out of the man. And the next time we see him, he is clothed. You know, the, the Lord will always put clothes on you. More than sometimes you want to wear. Don't make me have to deal with that right now. Clothed and in his right mind. And this is, this is what startles me, pastors. This is the first time the scripture says when they see the man clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus worshiping, they were afraid. They weren't afraid when he was in the tombs, when he was howling at the moon, when he's running around naked and chained and all, had all those demon spirits. It doesn't say anything about it. But when they see him clothed in his right mind, suddenly they are afraid. Sometimes I think we're afraid of things we ought not be afraid of. And we're not afraid of things we ought to be afraid of. I think sometimes we get it a little bit wrong. I'm not afraid of a worshiping church. Not afraid of an exuberant church. I know if you've never been in the atmosphere, it might be a little unsettling, but, but this is the presence of God. We're, we may all be shouting at the same time, but we're all lifting our voice to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not random. We're not just fans at a ball game tonight. We are worshipers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, he wants to join the evangelistic crusade. He goes to Jesus, I want to go on the boat. I want to just go with you. I want to go where you're going. But the Lord tells him, no, you're not coming with me. I want you to go home to your friends. I want you to go to your family. And I want you to tell them the things that I have done for you. This man went from hell damaged to heaven blessed and ultimately heaven sent as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I speak of hell in this context, hell damaged, I'm not talking about hell in its eternal sense, the eternal nature of hell in the context of hell as the final eternal punishment of the wicked. But since we brought it up, let's just pause there for a moment. There is much to be said. The horrors of eternal punishment without remedy or release, whatever hell is, it is eternal. It is eternity without God. It is a horrible place of punishment without remedy, without release, without recovery, and it ought to be weighed heavily on our minds. The very idea that an eternal hell an eternal damnation without God is one of the possibilities handed out at the judgment is all by itself something to be concerned about. So much that Jude the Apostle says of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. Soul winning is pulling people out of the fires of eternal of an eternity without God. Now, I told y'all a little bit of my story on Sunday and along the way. Y'all know my background. And a little service observation of the rock music culture tells you that there's a highway to hell and a stairway to heaven. It might give you a little idea what kind of crowds they're expecting. I want to be on the stairway, not the highway. I ain't know about you, but I've got my mind made up. I'm coming out of this world. I've got my mind made up. I've got the Lord before me. I've got the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. you got to make up your mind somewhere which direction you're headed in this thing. But with all that said, the actual focus of the message tonight is not about the eternal context of hell, but, but when I speak of hell damage, I'm talking about the tormenting demonic forces of darkness, the hell that many people live in as they live through this life, the emotional hell, the mental hell, the things that they've gone through, some even physical abuse that has come to them in life. The demonic in this story had been severely damaged by demonic forces of hell. 
His peace was gone. His joy was gone. His hope was gone. His self-dignity was gone. His family was in disarray. He had nothing. Hell had damaged him seemingly beyond repair. The woman called in adultery who was carried out and laid at the feet of Jesus, publicly humiliated, socially scarred, was another example of a hell-damaged life. Hell inflicts its pain through attacks, temptations, and demonic spirits. Spirits of fear cause many to be damaged with anxiety and with paranoias. Spirits of bondage inflict the pain of addiction and hopelessness. Spirits of heaviness inflict with depression and sadness and hopelessness upon thousands. Spirits of infirmity cause pain through sickness, through disease, and through physical weakness. The landscape of life is populated with those who are damaged emotionally, physically, and mentally by hell's wrath and all of the evil deceptions. It's one of the things I like when I come to a church and I see young people like these sitting right here on the first couple of rows is I realize how much damage they are avoiding just by being here. I told you a lot of the things I got myself involved in early on in life. Well, several years back when both my sons were still at home and I was carrying them from revival to revival on the evangelistic field. I was preaching at a conference in Florida, Touch the Future Conference. It was one of the daytime services. My youngest son was probably about 17, going on 18 at that time. And we were in the daytime service, and it was a good service. Power of God was moving, but I was sitting over here. My son was sitting over here. And when I looked over at him, he didn't appear to me to be paying attention. He was on, his, on and off his phone too much. He wasn't worshiping much. He was just sitting. And once I noticed it, then I started paying attention to it. And we're up and we're down and we're praying and we're worshiping and he's just sitting and just sitting. And the more it went on, the more upset I was getting. I was losing my victory because he didn't have any. Finally, I sat down. I don't know. I lost track of what the preacher was preaching. I got to praying for my son. Oh, God, you got to touch him. Look at him over there. He's cold, backslid, ain't worshiping, not praying, he's not doing anything. Oh, God, you got to help him. I don't want him to go to hell. I don't want him to get on drugs and alcohol. Oh, God, help him, Lord. Save my son. And when I finally took a breath, as the Lord often does, he spoke to me and said, well, he's doing better than you were doing at his age. At least you're here. <laughs> Amen. The Lord was saying, you know what? At least he's here. He's not out there. <laughs> Amen. Fortunately, we got through that little situation because I did have a little talk with him about it. You know, just a you know, just a little nudge in the right direction. With all that we are fighting in this critical hour that we're in, no wonder. Oh, my timer got to, oh my goodness. No wonder we are encouraged to put on the whole armor of God. If you're going to have to walk through a hell storm, you need to have on the full armor. Here I go again. This is no time to go out into the world half-dressed. That's why we're living the way we live. That's why we walk the way we walk. Some people said it's isolation. I think it's insulation. I was on the airplane with a friend of mine. He had kind of left the faith, and we ended up in the seats beside each other. And he was telling me, he said, well, he said, I understand, but you're just in a bubble. I said, well, you're right about that. I said, but I've raised my family for 30 years in this bubble. We don't go places others go. We don't wear things others wear. We don't do things others do. We don't say things others say. Maybe it is a little bubble, but it's been a safe place. I said, it's been safe. I said, bro, the thing that's bothering you is blessing me. I like this bubble. I, I don't, I don't want to be part of this world. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. I, I was raised on the scripture that said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. That's been a place of safety and security for our home. 
and for our sons and now our sons-in-laws, or or excuse me, daughters-in-laws, and now our grandchildren that are coming along. And I say, oh, God, let us keep this thing. Let us preserve this. I'd hate to think there ever come a day that we had so blended into the world that what we have tonight doesn't even exist for another generation to be a part of if they choose. The timeless beauty of this story of this demoniac is found in two verses. They found him clothed and in his right mind and he was full of the testimony of the power of God. See, God repairs hell damage and he'll help get you in your right mind. That's what's getting ready to happen here in the next few minutes of this service. God's getting ready to set some folks in their right mind. We get a warped thinking. Our mind gets twisted. The Bible said in the last days it's going to be so bad that they're going to call that which is evil good and that which is good evil. But when you come into the house of God like we're in tonight, no matter how heavy it may be, you can find yourself back in your right mind. I'm prophesying over this congregation tonight, God is going to repair some hell damage. God's going to repair the wounds and the hurts and the damage and the torment and the destruction and the brokenness and all the abuse. He's going to fix you. And then he's going to look at you and he's going to send you out and say, listen, go. Go tell them. Go tell your friends. Go tell your family. Go tell anyone that will listen to you. Look what the Lord has done. I was half asleep today and that little chorus got in my spirit. Look what the Lord has done. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out. Come on. You're not an alcoholic anymore. You're not a drug addict anymore. You're not about ready to commit suicide anymore. You're not demon possessed anymore. You're not discouraged. You're not hopeless. You're not helpless. We've been repaired and restored and renewed. God's turned my hell damage into a blessing. (laughs) Somebody shout, yeah. Now I'm getting ready to turn a hard right turn in this sermon. I just wanted to get a little foundation out there. I have a story I want to tell you about severe hell damage. Yeah, I changed the word a little bit. Hell damage. That's not the southern way of saying hell damage. Said all that. Now he went southern on us talking about hell damage. No, I've switched from hell damage to the hell damage. God turned some hell damage into a blessing in our lives. We had two vehicles that were old and getting high mileage. And I drive about an hour and 15 minutes or so every week to an airport. I fly about everywhere I go. So every single week, it's in and out of that airport, and the vehicles were getting a little bit of a concern to us. We got to praying about it, and in the middle of praying about it, we got a prophecy. A precious lady on the phone prophesied to my wife. This was in late 2018, around November. She said, by the end of the year, God's going to give y'all a new vehicle. Well, hallelujah. My God, don't be so discouraged. It's not the IRS I'm preaching about here tonight. (laughs) We got excited about it. End of the year is not that far off. We're ready. Well, we got to the end of November, nothing. We got to the end of December, nothing. We're in the middle of January, nothing. We decided not to be technical. We don't know what God meant by the end of the year. We give it up into January, up into February, up into March. We're still holding on. Somewhere around May and June, we're kind of like, you know, I think we got to kind of wake up and smell the coffee here. (laughs) The end of the year is a long way back there now. Can't even see it anymore. So we kind of had to chalk that up to the, you know, the prophecy didn't didn't come to pass. At least not like we expected it to or thought, you know, she said. (laughs) We're trying to give a little rope here, you know. (laughs) But it is what it is. 
I'm a very spiritual person, but I, I have this analytical brain. <laughs> and when it, December 31st came and went, I'm thinking, okay, we missed the deadline. <laughs> the prophecy is expired. Yeah, y'all liking this. Some of y'all have some expired prophecies. <laughs> That's right. It is what it is. By the way, there is a difference between a false prophecy and a false prophet. Some of y'all won't give anybody a break. Somebody could get a prophecy incorrect, and that doesn't necessarily make them a false prophet. Now, if they get a track record going, might have to pause and say, hey, let's you know, back up the train here. and let's, Why don't you go into the prayer ministry for a while? Your prophesying doesn't seem to be... They're just not coming to pass, okay? I mean, that's just, just you know, back, back up, driver. We're clear up into the month of August. I come home from a revival meeting, and my wife's been praying. He's praying women. He don't know what they're going to come up with. She's on the phone every morning with a hundred-something ladies for an hour. I get home, I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm ready to kick back my pajamas, and she's all fired up. She done been talking to Jesus. She said, the Lord spoke to me. I said, well, what in the world? She said, you know, we had a prophecy. We're supposed to get a vehicle. I said, no, no, I was trying not to think about that. She said, the Lord told me that we need to sow into that prophecy. I said, well, what, what, what are we supposed to do? She said, we need to give away a vehicle. I said, well, we only got two, and both of them are about, you know, needing replaced. There was a family there in the church. Their vehicle was ten times worse than ours. We're not hard on vehicles. We had a 2007 Kia van. We keep things pretty nice. It had some high mileage on it, 150,000 miles or something, but it was just in really wonderful, pristine condition. It was worth maybe $7,500, $8,000. She said, we need to give it. So I called pastor of the church that we attend there told him what we were feeling, told him the family we were feeling to give to. They got a number of kids. Their vehicle's about ready to, it's got smoke rolling out the back. The tires are bald. Fenders are falling off. They'll be happy with this one. He said, sure, go ahead. If you have that video, can you put that video on of my wife? She's standing there, got the blue. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the Lord has spoken to me, and we're giving you our vehicle. You want a blessing? Watch the little guy. Are you serious? Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're the what? Yes. Your prayers come answered. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. Somebody ought to just by faith. Yeah. I've come to prophesy something good is about to happen. Put that picture up with them standing outside in front of that van, that whole little family. Come on. Something good is about to happen in your life. We had it washed and waxed and detailed, made sure the tires were good. My wife took it down now. Now, now there is a wonderful husband and father of this family. He was at work. So that's the only reason he's not in the picture. He's out working. Hard job. But he's a good man. This is a good family. And we felt led and we sewed that vehicle into them. So now we're down to one jalopy. That was in the month of August. We sowed into an expired prophecy. December of that year, it's December the 24th. It's Christmas Eve. My boys are coming to visit with their wives. I wasn't being particularly spiritual, but the Lord thundered in my soul as I was meditating and praying in the morning. Your wilderness season is over. I'm taking you now into a season of abundance. I was like, man, I like the sound of that. I'm not, I don't understand it, but yea, Lord, even so. Jesus, take the wheel. You got this thing. I like the way you talk. Two weeks later, Pastor Trammell up in Michigan called me. said, I need to ask you to do something a little strange. What's that? I want you to come preach. Can you come preach the last Sunday of December, about two weeks or about, excuse me, about a week or so later, and stay over the weekend. I said, yes, I can. I have it, I have it open. He said, well, I want you to buy a one-way ticket, and I'll explain it to you when you get here. Well, that was a little perplexing to me. 
I thought maybe he wants to see if revival's going to catch and maybe we're going to go on a while or I don't know what he's got going on. So we got a one-way ticket to Michigan, went and preached the last Sunday of December 2019. I got done laying hands on people and praying. He said, get your wife up here and stay on the platform. So we're standing on the platform, and they put up on the screen. You got that picture with it up on the screen, the white vehicle. So, so I'm standing on the platform, and up on the screen, I'm looking up there, and I don't see real well, but I'm looking at it, and I'm squinting. And I said, is that Alexis? He said, it is. And he said, it's for you. There's a business family in this church that God has moved on them, and they want to give you this vehicle to be a blessing to you and Sister Kleindens. Can you go to the next one where we're standing by it outside? Give you a real good picture of it. 2019 Lexus GX 460. That's the big boy. <laughs> Woo! Hey, I was out of the wilderness fast. I'm already over to the Sunny Banks of Sweet Deliverance. In my lifetime, my wife and I's lifetime, we have given away five vehicles through the years. If you add all of them up, they don't add up to that one. <laughs> I got a little nosy and got in there into the glove box, into the paperwork. Gentleman paid $63,000 for that vehicle. Gave us the keys told us the story. He said, Brother Kleindens, I bought this vehicle last year in December for my daughter. She immediately went into a severe portion of her pregnancy and had to go bed rest. So we just parked the vehicle and said, this year in the month of August, sitting there, it got in a hailstorm and got a lot of hail damage. So he said, we were just going to, I got the insurance money, and I was just going to send it to auction. He's a businessman, owns a paving company. He said, I auctioned off hundreds of vehicles. So I was sitting at my desk. He said, I got out the paperwork. I'm trying to fill it out. And he said, I got a little lightheaded. So he said, I just waited a second. So I went back to filling out the paperwork. I couldn't figure out how to fill it out. My mind went foggy. He said, I wasn't sure what was happening. I laid my pen down. I laid my head back. And I said, Lord, you have to touch me. And the Lord said, don't send the vehicle to auction. My wife loves this part of the story. I wish she was here. Give it to Sister Kleindance. <laughs> so she has stable, reliable, safe, comfortable transportation for taking her husband back and forth to the airport every week. So God spoke to him, and that's what caused him to go to his pastor and make this vehicle become a reality for us. Now here's the interesting thing. It was the very last Sunday of 2019. I feel like God let it be on the last Sunday just to get my attention. And when I got to looking at the paperwork, I remembered what the man said. I bought this vehicle last year. That vehicle was bought December 2018 and delivered to us December 2019. The prophecy that looked like it didn't come to pass that God's going to get you a vehicle by the end of the year actually looked like it was fulfilled twice. The Lord bought it, set it, but it was on hold until we stepped out by faith on an expired prophecy and sowed into our prophetic expectation. Come on, you can sow with money. You can sow with praise. You sow with prayer. You sow every time you come to church. You say, I've got a feeling something good is about to happen. That's why you're here. That's why you worship. That's why you give. That's why you talk to people about the Lord. You're expecting something. Woo! I don't have any Bible for this. They can call me before the district board. But I'm going to do it anyhow. I'm going to operate in the office of the prophet right now. And I want to speak to expired prophecies. And I want to reactivate them in the name of Jesus.
I'm taking, I'm crossing out the expiration date. I want to say the intent is still there. The date may have come and gone. That season may have passed, but God's going to give us another season and another opportunity. And I want to speak to the things that looked like they were stolen. The the opportunities that got away, the blessings that slipped through our fingers, the chances that it shoulda, coulda, woulda, but God's going to restore the years. I prophesy into this church tonight, all the way back some 20-something years of revival, all the coulda beens, all the shoulda beens, all the woulda beens, and it looked like we might have missed it a little here and fell short a little there, but God's going to restore the years. That the locust is eaten and the canker worm and the palmer worm and the great army that he set among us. Did you show that picture with my wife sitting in there when I wasn't looking? Show that picture. She, if you got that, there she is. She loves that picture. I wish she was here to see it. She claims that's her vehicle, but it's got both our names on it. I didn't even really know that much about what it was. I had ridden in some, but I'm driving that baby down the road going home. And I said, baby, I don't know if you realize it or not, but this is some kind of something. This ain't no small blessing happening here. And she said, this is this, let's look what the Lord has done. I said, however, we do have a problem. I said, I don't know if you realize it or not, but when we get this thing to Florida, we're going to have to pay sales tax, which I'm not sure we can afford. <laughs> I had not posted it on social media. But I had sent a little picture of us standing in front of it to about 10 or 15 of my friends. One of them called me while we're having the conversation about the sales tax. I said, I'm riding in it right now, bro. Got the air conditioned seats on. Music playing. I'm out of the wilderness, bro. You need to come on over here. He said, well, I was just thinking about something. He said, have you considered the fact when you get that thing home you're gonna have to pay sales tax I said you know we were just talking about that he said probably be about two thousand dollars or more I said yeah he said well I want to be part of this blessing I said what do you mean he said I'm on my way to Florida right now meet me in Pensacola we're gonna have dinner I want to pay the sales tax so I go to dinner and he slides a check for two thousand dollars across the table When I got it to the DMV, because I had a letter of donation, I didn't even have to pay sales tax. I called the man back, tried to give him his money. He said, no, the Lord told me to give it to you. Just keep it. So now, come on, I told you we were going to rocket shot here tonight. I don't have time to build up to this. I got to just deliver the whole enchilada. Because it had hail damage, there were dents all over. The the paint was not cracked, but there was, do you have that picture with the circles? Uh, it, it just had hail damage, and you can't see it real well from the picture, but literally there's hundreds of dents all over the, all over the hood, down the sides, across the top. There was a, a ding in the windshield, and when we got it out of the cold Michigan down into the warm Florida, the ding became a crack, went all the way across the windshield. My wife was testifying about it on her prayer call the next day, and one of the ladies texted her and said, what are we going to do about that cracked windshield? She said, well, my husband said we're going to get a new one. She said, well, I won't be part of this blessing. I won't pay for that cracked windshield. So we got a new windshield in, and we got that paid for. I went up to Atlanta, Georgia to preach, and my buddy said, bring that Lexus. I want to see that thing. So I drove it up there. While I was driving, I called pastor of the church. This was actually when I was on the way home from Michigan before I went to Atlanta. Called pastor of the church where we attend, telling him about the Lexus. He said, how'd this happen? I got to telling him about the hail damage and everything. The man was going to auction it off. He decided to give it to us instead. And pastor says to me on the phone, oh, that's no problem. I know someone can fix your dents. Oh, no, you, you, you didn't hear it. Pastor knows someone. That can fix your dents. Some of y'all still didn't get it. You need to pray a little more before you come to church next time. That's what we do in here every week. We're trying to tell you about somebody that can fix your dents, that can fix your damage, that can fix your broken places. 
that can fix what this world has done to you, the hail damage. Hail damaged that car, but God turned it into a blessing. I got to preaching about it everywhere I went. First time I preached about it there in the home church in, in Souls Harbor. While I'm preaching, a businessman in the church writes out a check for $100,000 and brings it up and gives it to the church building fund. I was preaching it out here in California. A man interrupted me while I was preaching, wrote out a check for $10,000 to their church's building fund. Over several months, I got to preaching everywhere. Next thing, we have up to about 500 something thousand dollars been raised going into churches and missions and ministries. I drove it up to Atlanta. I preached about it. Brother Wayne Huntley and Mark Foster were there. If you know Brother Mark Foster, he's a wiry little fella. He said, he said, Brother Condes, take me out there. I want to see that vehicle. I want to, I want to put my hand on that blessing. We go out there, and I'm showing him. He said, where are them dents? And I'm showing him all the dents down the sides. He says, he said, how much pastor say it's going to cost to fix him? I said, well, I had the man come out. He said, $1,700, but if I'd pay him cash, he'd do it for 1000 Pastor Foster took his checkbook out, laid it on the hood on the dents, wrote me a check for $1,000, said, I want to be part of this blessing. Go fix your dents. So the man came out, fixed all the dents. If I didn't tell you it had dents, you wouldn't even. I said, if I didn't tell you it had dents, you wouldn't even know it ever had dents. It's like the, it's like the tenth leper that came back. Nine went and showed themselves to the priest, but one came back and worshiped, and the Lord said, your faith has made thee whole. He didn't just stop the leprosy in its tracks. I believe he took away all the damage, restored the finger endings, took away the disfiguration. By the time the Lord got done with the one that came back to worship, you'd have never knew he even was a leper. I'm prophesying to you tonight. God can restore you. God can help you. God can heal you so completely. It's like you never were abused. It's like you never were a drunk. It's like you never were addicted. It's like you never did have psychological or emotional problem. He can fix your dents till the most trained eye can't even see they were ever there. Woo! I'm telling you, I, I know there's some hail damage here tonight, but I feel the blessing of the Lord in the house. Not only did God bless us in a financial kind of way with this vehicle, but the Lord used it as a sign in our life that I can take something that's been damaged and I can turn it into a blessing. And that is a blessing. Now, when the man fixed all the dents, there was one right over the driver's door. You can't see it in the picture. He said, I got this one right here. He said, I need to go. I said, you know what? Leave that one. Every time I tug on the handle to get in, I want to remember God took this damaged vehicle and turned it in to a blessing. Now, I don't know if you caught it as I was going along, but the man bought the vehicle in December 2018, gave it to us in December 2019. But in the course of his story, he said, in the month of August, it was in a hailstorm. It was the month of August that my wife was standing over there in those folks' house, handing over the keys and the title to our vehicle. While up in Michigan, God's raining down a little hail on a Lexus because we set something in motion when we said it may look like it's expired, but I've got faith to sow into a prophetic word from God. So I was preaching about this at Souls Harbor. And while I'm preaching along, I tell him a story about a friend of mine named Mark Hattabal down in South Florida. I was telling him all these blessings. He said, my goodness, God, the next thing you're going to tell me, somebody bought you a year's worth of gas. Well, what had happened was, I told that that night I was preaching. Man came to me after service, a businessman, preacher. He said, you know, I've been coming to the conference here, and you preach a lot of stuff. I've always thought about maybe being a blessing to you in some kind of way. He said, I'm sitting here tonight. 
And I'm thinking, man, the tax is paid, the windshield's fixed, the, you know, the hail damage is done. You know, I don't know how to get involved in this. And he said, I'm having that very thought go through my brain when you say a year's worth of gas. So he reached in his pocket, hand me his business credit card, and said, keep it for a year. Up to $300 a month is your budget. So for a solid year, I'm driving a Lexus God gave me with fixed dents God paid for with a new windshield I didn't buy on gas that I didn't pay for, taxes I didn't have to pay. And it was starting to get ridiculous at this point. So a man come up to me in Atlanta, said, is there anything left? I said, I don't know, bro, just whatever God speaks to you. I mean, so you just got to figure out how to get in here now. I can't help you anymore. I, I'm so blessed I'm about to drown in it over here. You just have to figure out how to get in. You're every man for himself. But on the way to church that night, a light came on. Well, I am not real mechanically inclined. So the light come on and I panicked. My wife panicked. We're like, oh no, the devil's going to destroy our blessing. <laughs> and I got her getting out the manual, finding out what the light was. The light was just telling us that it was time for an oil change. <laughs> but I never drove no vehicle that told you. When it started knocking, I knew we needed to put some oil in it. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we go and he, oh, thank the Lord. All we need is an oil change. I kid you not. This man says, well, I don't know. He said, the only thing I can think of is when you get home, I feel like you should go get your oil change, and I want to pay for your first oil change. I said, well, it just so happens I need one right now. Here's what I am trying to point out to you. It may, you may go a long time where it seemed like not much is happening. And you've been faithful and you've been doing your part. But I am telling you, when the dam breaks and when the wind begins to blow and the flood comes in, I mean, God was blessing me faster than I could keep up with it. Let me back up, finish this message. The man that gave me the vehicle, it was New Year's weekend. So everything was closed. We had to stay over Monday after New Year's Day to go get a temporary tag to drive it home. I'm driving out of town. The man calls me. He said, Brother Klein, is you still? I said, I'm leaving town right now. He said, I've just got to tell you this. He said, you know, it's, it's, it's New Year's weekend. We've been closed all weekend. He said, with my doors closed, the closed sign in the window, one of my secretaries went in just to clean up her office and rearrange things for the new year. She's he said, first it was one man, knock on the door. He said, oh, I'm so glad you were in here. I saw the close sign. He said, but I need to spend money by the end of the year. Please give this to Mr. Kevin and tell him that it's already paid for. We need some work done. Said about an hour later, another man knocked on the closed door. Said, I need to spend some money by the end of the year. He said, Brother Kleindance, I've got two checks laying on my desk that add up to more than the cost of that vehicle you're driving home. He said, I've been in business 25 years. That has never happened to me before. It can't be an accident that you're not even out of town with the blessing. And uh, I want you to know that God, now I know y'all nervous wreck that I'm going to raise an offering. I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not raising an offering. That's up to you. You do whatever you want to do. I'm just imparting something. I, am, I want to impart blessing on you. I'm not here to ask you for something. I'm here to give you something. Amen. Now, I never really have ever preached this that somebody didn't do something. But that's up to you. This is not, I'm not in an offering raising sermon here tonight. I am in an impartation sermon here tonight. I am trying to tell you that there is a dimension of God's blessing that when God decides he's going to bless you, there's not a devil in hell that is strong enough to stop it. And it will be exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or even think. I've come to impart what God has done for me. So I boldly stand here tonight and I say, such as I have. 
give I thee. I declare hell damage be turned into heaven's blessing. I declare tonight that God's going to turn it around. I declare this is a turnaround service. I declare it's time for the wind to blow in a new direction. It's going to come now in your favor. Brother Williams, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I feel the struggle. I feel the struggle in you and your wife tonight financially, and that's what I'm talking about. But I am prophesying over you tonight. It's about to turn around. God's going to send someone. God's going to send few someones. God's going to give you an idea. God's going to put something in your mind and in your heart. Come on, can anybody... Anybody stand to be blessed? Anybody believe God wants to help you in some kind of way, both spiritually and financially? I want to emphasize the spiritual, but I am not taking the financial off the table. The spiritual help is the most important, but I am not taking the financial blessing off the table tonight. God spoke to me, said, if you can impart it, if they can receive it, this service is going to be a turnaround. Instead of shouting about my story, we're going to be shouting about your story. Woo! The man that gave me the gas card at the end of the year said, it's the best year our business has ever had. The man that bought the oil change two days later, somebody come up to him and said, I want to pay for you a contract, a maintenance contract on your vehicle, $2,800 for a $50 oil change. I heard you. I was back here trying to give them these pictures. I heard you telling a story. I heard it. I said, oh, I must be right in the vein here tonight. Uh, pastor talking about a sister. Somebody sold $300. It wasn't long. 3000 came back. Now, you chalk this up any way you want to. I just happen to do believe if you sow it, God will grow it. You plant the seed, he'll meet the need. Come on. You can chalk it. If you don't want it, that's up to you. If you think I'm just a money-grabbing preacher, that's fine. You believe what you want to believe. If I was, I'd have started grabbing a long time before now. I just about waited too late. You just have to interpret this any way you want to. But I'm telling you, God will bless you. The Bible said, as a man purposes in his heart, so let him give. I think there is a missions offering we give to send the gospel. There's compassion's offering we give out of love to alleviate somebody's suffering. There are times we raise up money to build a new church so we have some comfortable seats to sit on. Every one of those is the reward for what we give, and we don't expect anything else. But there is such a thing as sowing by faith, and you reap what you sow. Musicians, y'all get up here and bail me out here tonight. I got to tell you one more. It's going to throw you, throw you clear off the cliff. So all through the pandemic, everybody else was in the wilderness, but we were not in the wilderness. When I got COVID, I got a bad case of COVID. I had COVID for eight weeks. Couldn't get over it. And when evangelists can't preach, they don't have any money coming in. But people started sending me money in the mail. And more money came in the mail when I wasn't preaching than I was getting when I was preaching. So I don't know if they were trying to tell me to just stay home or what, but I was losing weight because of COVID. But I told everybody it's because I was running back and forth to the mailbox so much. One preacher called me and said, how you doing? I said, I'm doing terrible. Coughing, hacking, fevers, lungs are tight. About to die down here. He said, well, can you give me your address? I want to send you some money. I said, it's the only thing that makes me feel better. Get it down here as quick as you can. I'm dying, bro. So I was conscientious because so many people were in the wilderness that I didn't want to be insensitive to that. So I didn't talk about this much. I didn't talk about God's blessing. I didn't talk about all the things that were happening to us, even when I went back to preaching. I didn't talk about the blessings of God's people in our life. 2020 was actually probably one of the best years I've ever had in all kinds of ways. Now, I didn't like preaching to empty auditoriums and computer screens. I was preaching on my computer screen one night. I was getting all fired up. I was crying. I was getting, and I got a text from one of my friends. I said, Brother Klein Dentz, you're moving me so much. I got up to go to the altar and ran into the TV. <laughs> that, 
that computer preacher not but it got to the end of the year 2020 and I was preaching over in Boatbridge, Louisiana felt like the Lord dropped it in my heart and I said Lord I don't want to be insensitive people have suffered people are grieving there's been a lot of pain I don't want to I don't want to be he said no let them know let them know the blessings are still real you can still sow in the time of famine and reap so I preached about this that night there was a home missionary pastor in the service pastor got up he felt like we ought to do something he felt like he was moved by the Holy Ghost. He asked that man, he said, how much are you paying monthly to try to rent that building you're going to have church in? He said, $1,500. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mess around. Pastor was easing into it. You know, I said, hey, I'll give the first $1,500. I preached the message. I said, my wife and I want to buy a home. We don't even have a down payment. I said, but I want to sow $1,500 into this man tonight as seed toward God helping us to get a home. I don't understand why y'all get so quiet when I say that stuff. Maybe I'm preaching doctrine you don't believe in. Maybe that's why God has me preaching it. The next day, I sent it on the platform that night with PayPal. The next day, I'm in my little RV. I'm texting a man many states away, not even in the United Pentecostal Church. He's asking me about my grandbaby. I'm telling him, Said, we're thinking about moving to Louisiana. He said, yeah, you need to get close to your grandbabies. He said, what are you planning on doing? I said, well, we feel like we'd like to buy a house. The next text, where God guides, God provides. He said, let me know when you're ready. I'm going to send you $20,000 to help you with your down payment. And he's already sent me 10. Wasn't even 24 hours. I don't know who this is going to get in your spirit tonight. Amen. And God's going to start turning your business around. God's going to turn your finances around. God's going to turn things around in your life. Would you stand with me here tonight? Stand with me all across this auditorium. It's the last night of this revival. I don't know how long it's going to be before I ever get back here again. But when I get back here, I believe I'm going to hear testimonies. Brother Klein, here's what we did. And here's what God did. I prayed for a lady in one church. She said, I don't even have a car at all. I don't have nothing. I said, let me lay hands on you. I'm handing them out like Oprah. When I got back there six months later, she said, Brother Klein, I didn't even have one. I ended up having three give to me. I had to give one away. She's now giving away what she didn't even have. She went from the land of lack to a land of abundance. Uh, I am prophesying over somebody here tonight. You're about to go from empty nets uh, to abundant nets. Uh, you're going from lack. Uh, God's going to bless you. God's going to help you. God's going to reward you. Uh, God sees your faith. Uh, God understands. Uh, would you close your eyes, lift your hands toward heaven, uh, and say, Lord, if nobody else receives this, I receive this tonight. Well, that's an awful quiet prayer. So, before service tonight, I did not feel well. Some of the brethren in the office laid hands on me and prayed for me. And I received a touch that gave me enough strength to get out here and preach. I don't know if you noticed when I first got up, my voice was quite gone as well. I have fought quite a battle. And now I understand why. The Lord just spoke to me. He said, keep plowing, preacher. You're going to break through something for these folks. I don't know if you don't believe in it. I don't know if you just don't think it can happen. I don't know if somebody told you it's not legit. I don't know if you don't trust the motives. I don't know what the holdup is here in your spirit somewhere. But I am just come to tell you. That God is able to do exceeding abundantly. I know the TV preachers have abused it. I know it's been abused everywhere. But I'm not a TV preacher. And I'm not here to abuse you. I am trying to preach you and prophesy you and your faith into a season of blessing. Until God can say, your wilderness is over. This church has been 
wandering and wayfaring for 20 years in a rented facility. I declare by the prophetic word tonight, it is time to enlarge our tent, drive some stakes into some new borders. God's gonna make a way where there is no way. Before I turn this back to a focus on ministry of the Spirit in this altar, all this is ministry in the Spirit. I'm just on the financial part at the moment. I feel led to give you full disclosure. I could not have purchased that vehicle. I couldn't have qualified for the loan. I got good credit. But I, it's hard for evangelists to get loans, especially for that kind of money on my budget. Couldn't have bought it. When I was telling my wife about getting a vehicle, I said, we're going to need God to have to help us. One of my friends prophesied, I said, I saw your vehicle, it's going to be white. It was about three years before we got it. When I got it, I drove it into his driveway and let him come out and see it. God went so far beyond. As a matter of fact, he's got a sense of humor. You heard me preaching the other night about doorways to the supernatural, and I said, God's not Santa Claus. He's not Burger King. All over this country, I've used the illustration. You don't tell God, I want a new Louis Vuitton. I want a new Lexus. I want a new house by the sea. I've used a Lexus a hundred times. Don't ask God for a Lexus. And I feel like God said, why not? Why are you telling me what I can do and can't do? I don't think it was an accident when God decided to give me a vehicle. He said, preacher, will you stop? Let my people believe or whatever they want to believe for. I never asked for it. I've never asked for anything specifically and of any kind. When the house right now, we're not asking for any kind of house. Just wherever you want us, God. I trust God's plans better than mine. But I feel like the Lord said, You've told my people all over this nation, now look what I did. Ha, 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 God's going to bless some of you beyond your own faith, beyond your own understanding. He's fixing some dents here right now. The spirit of deliverance is in this service. The spirit of restoration is here. Maybe somebody that's been going through life all dented up, emotionally wounded, scarred, and hurt, and grieved. You'd slip out of your seat and walk down to this altar tonight and say, I got some dents, but I think I have some value. I think God can fix my damage, turn me into a blessing to somebody. I was walking through an altar in Ohio, laid hands on a lady, prophesied over her, anchor of hope. The Lord's going to give you an anchor of hope. I came back six months later. She handed me a business card. Anchor of Hope Ministries. She had had an abortion young in life. She felt guilt so long. Never felt like she was healed of it. She said, when you prophesied over me, the Lord told me to go into this ministry and helping young girls that are in the trouble I was in. She said, I just got done testifying before the Ohio Senate just this week. God turned a little simple prophetic word into a ministry. And out of her greatest pain was birthed her greatest ministry. I don't know who I'm prophesying to right now, but God's going to take your dents. God's going to take your damage. God's going to take your greatest failure. God's going to take your biggest setback, and he's going to turn it into an opportunity to minister. That's where the oil is going to flow. Would you lift your hands to the Lord wherever you are? I'm going to let the musicians carry us now. But for the next few minutes, angels of healing are here. Angels of blessing are here. Angels of anointing are here. Say, Lord, take my damage and turn it into my destiny. I know you can fix my dents. You can minister from a broken marriage. You can minister from a failure. So come alive in 
the name of Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything to the feet of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. God's going to turn the damage into a blessing. Somebody get in their right mind right now. Everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything to the feet of Jesus. You're going to leave here in your right mind. We want to thank you for joining us today and believe with you that God has spoken to you through the sermon and worship. If you have decided today, you know what, I need to give my life to God, 
or recommit to him, we would love to connect with you, pray with you, and be here with you on your journey in strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether that be through a Bible study, baptism, or striving to receive the infilling of the Spirit, we want to connect with you to see the amazing things God is doing and going to do in your life. Or if you have any questions, we want to welcome you to our online family. Go to truevine.live and click connect. If you're worshiping with us on YouTube, just click that subscribe button. Or if you're on Facebook, please like our page. Go ahead right now, comment, and then click the share button. And if this ministry has blessed you, partner with us by giving to God's kingdom here at Truevine. You can give a one-time gift or a recurring donation. The giving options are coming up right after this. We look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. God bless. Thank you.